Go ahead, Randy. Do your okay. okay. Welcome to the Meek Sig uh, monthly meeting. And um, um we are here with Brett and our guest speaker, who um Brett will introduce in just a moment. And um, in the meantime, I am posting the code of conduct um for our meetings as well as the antitrust statement. And I will also be posting our link for LinkedIn and our um, Discord. So um, anyone um, interested in those um, joining us, and we would encourage that you encourage you to join us on uh, LinkedIn as well as on Discord and on YouTube on the YouTube channel. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Randy. Welcome all. I am Brett Russell, co-chair of the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. Today, we're going to mash it up with Todd Holmes, Associate Professor of Entertainment Media Management at California State University, Northridge. We have a lot to chat about, so let's get to it. We will delve into the many issues the entertainment industry faces, including the music industry. We would like to take the discussion to where the potential for addressing some of these industry challenges can be had with new technologies, specifically blockchain technology, and ultimately drill down to the chain of custody and generative AI. Good morning, Todd. Welcome to the Hyperledger Media and Entertainment SIG. We are happy to have you here. Thank you, Brett. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I appreciate the opportunity a lot. And thank you, Randy. Thank you, Todd. Todd, we'll start with uh, the uh, the big uh, uh, news uh, worthy, and that's the uh, Hollywood strikes. Can you um, start us off with your perspective on uh, the Writers Guild struggles and the eventual settlement, and then your thoughts on the current SAG in the studio dilemma? And then maybe we can uh, roll this uh, discussion into some ways we could possibly use technology to help them solve some of the challenges that they face. You have the floor, Todd. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brett. So yes, the the negotiations are are still, you know, of course, you know, taking place in terms of the actors. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on that in just a minute. But but first the uh you know WGA, uh, the Writers Guild of America was able to work out a deal at the end of September. Um, you know, fortunately, that that ended that that strike that was uh, went on for I believe 148 days. So a very very lengthy strike, very close to being the longest strike, writer strike in history, by only off by a few days. Um, it was highly anticipated uh, leading up to this. You know, industry insiders felt that this was going to happen this year, um, and and a lot of it. You know, there were several key concerns, and a lot of these are similar with uh, in terms of the actors with SAG. So uh, one of them was the residuals question, which certainly we'll, we'll touch on some today, and trying to come up with a with with some sort of bonus for streaming content, and that's in a lot of ways people have looked at these strikes as sort of almost being streaming strikes because it's um, due to the kind of the new technology has kind of changed the uh, the financial structure a little bit of the industry or the you know and and that is something that needs to be explored certainly looking at the business model there. But there were a couple of key things. Um, so as it came down to it, the um, the final resolution was in terms of the the bonuses on residuals was essentially that that um, shows that would bring in at least twenty percent of the people that are subscribed to a certain streaming platform. If you're bought in at least that twenty percent, then um, within ninety days, that means that basically there would be a fifty percent bump in uh, in the residuals or a residual bonus on top of the uh, the flat rate. Um, so that was that was important. There were some discussions about the writers rooms concern there and making sure that people were going to be compensated uh, fairly and because uh, one of the fundamental issues is that streaming shows um, typically are, are shorter a shorter number of episodes. so that means obviously then less time for writers and actors to be, uh, tied to that show and then compensated. And then also that can mean, of course, more time in between, you know, the production of, of different shows that you're involved in. So 
um, looking at that, um, that was, uh, it was determined that basically, yeah, there would be within these writer writers rooms, you'd have three, uh, of your full-time writers and you'd have three additional writers and producers and there'd be protections that, that at least people would be compensated for at least, uh, 10 weeks worth of work, 20 weeks worth of work for, for episodes that were going to be, you know, longer, longer in length. Um, AI was a big issue and is certainly with SAG after, as I'll talk about in a minute. But with the WGA, one of the biggest concerns was would AI uh, be used as source material? And essentially the agreement was that if AI, if if you have bring on writers and you send them some content, some ideas, and they're AI generated, that the people, the writers need to know that they're AI generated. They also have protections the writers do in making sure that their intellectual property, the scripts that they've written are not going to be used then for without their consent or without being compensated, if this were the case, um, for this material to then be used to train AI. Uh, now, in terms of SAG-AFTRA, that, that strike is still ongoing. I, you know, from everything I see, the resolution is imminent. I, I think it's going to happen within the next day or two. Uh, basically, they've been meeting continuously over about the last 10 days. They they had some talks through the weekend. So I think some things are going to happen there. Some of the key things there would be pay increases for one on what they call the minimum basic, basic agreement. And um, essentially in year one, initially SAG was asking for 11%. Uh, the AMPTP, the, which is the union for the studio, said, no, we can't do 11%, but we would do a 5%. Well, in, in the in the recent weeks, though, the AMPTP has decided to raise to up to seven percent for that first year of the new contract, where SAG after has been willing then to drop from eleven to nine percent. So there's sort of uh, they're getting closer in that negotiation. Um, in, in terms of the residuals, the same kind of uh, situation. The AMPTP has proposed the same deal that they worked out with the WGA, um, and that's. One thing that they did, one it, it, as they said the other day on Saturday, this was their best, their last best and final offer. They are offering now, um, very similar to what with the case with WGA, that if a, if a show brings in at least 20% of the subscribers of a streaming platform, that basically actors will be, their residuals will be doubled if this happens again within the first 90 days of release. So, so that was a key development. It'll be interesting to see how the actors respond. And that's where things stand right now. We're waiting to, to hear from the actors. The actors have wanted, first they wanted a 2% residual uh, increase. Then they dropped it to 1%. Then they went to a 57 cents per subscriber. And like I said, um, the MPTP has put that offer out there. So we'll, we'll certainly wait on that. And of course with AI too, concerns there about uh, potentially people, you know, having their likeness be used. And, and the idea is that people want to make sure that they're fairly compensated for their likeness being used and making sure that if if an actor is sort of digitally scanned, that it that it would be approved for only one project. And whereas the studios want to say, okay, we can we can scan an actor's likeness and use their likeness throughout an entire franchise. Well, that's one place where the actors are kind of pushing back. So those are those are kind of the key issues and where where things stand, but hopefully the the SAG after a strike will end in, in the next couple of days. Oh, next couple of days. That's what I'm hoping. I don't know. I, <laughs> at least all indications are, are saying that, but I, you know, I might have might have pie in my face here in a couple of days, but hopefully, um, hopefully that that will be the case. And, and like I said. Right now, SAG after is just reviewing that as the AMPTP AMP, AMP, PT said, this is our final final offer, final best and last offer. That's interesting. Tell me, what is the, uh, with respect to the uh, writers, I guess the first question I have is, why didn't the SAG, uh, the writers stay on strike um, to support the, uh, the SAG actors i mean it just seemed the sag the actors went to town and uh and were supportive of the the writers guild and they they put a lot of pressure on the studios i guess maybe they knew the uh 
that their time was coming up as well. But it, I just found it interesting that the uh, that as soon as the writer's strike was over, they guys they just left the picket line, dropped their 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 placards, and uh, and beat the feet. You know what? Uh, did you find that interesting, or what? Uh, what, what do you think? No, no, I, I did. I did a little bit, Brad. I, I certainly noticed that. I mean, I will say there are certainly some exceptions to the rule. There are some some G WGA members that were, were still picketing with the actors, but um, but you're right. I think a lot less so than the support that the actors provided the writers. I think a lot of it is just the fact that the writers had gone on for so long from early May until the end of last month without being able to write, without being able to work on projects. I think that they were just desperate to get started and 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 start creating content it, it, it honestly is i think the the main thing but you you would hope that maybe there'd be a little bit more a little bit more support from coming from the other side yeah yes. yeah what is the um in your in your opinion or uh, from the best of your knowledge what is what methods are actors and the agents uh uh what measures are they taking to ensure that they know that their likenesses and that scripts and uh, content isn't being either replicated or manipulated or used, uh, whether it be AI or any other way that it was generated? It, it was, is there something in the contract? Is there some tool that they've talked about? Uh, and how do they know? They can say, don't do it, but there also has to be some measure of uh, of, in, of of the ability to uh, to detect and then the enforcement is is another issue altogether because that's just lawyers but the the detection i think is a pretty important uh, component to that agreement was there any discussion about that that you're aware of not that i'm aware of a specific tools but certainly i do wonder about that is i mean uh, the certainly the actors and their attorneys certainly are saying okay yeah this is a this is a contractual thing. We'll make sure that all the legal verbiage is in there, the contract, certainly. But you're right. In terms of how do they enforce it, how do they really know? As far as I know, that there's no way for them to really to really know what the studios are, are planning on doing or what they're doing and, until content is released. And then, But even then, it may be that the actor does not even realize that their likeness was used maybe in a, in a, in a, in a franchise. And, and they said, okay, well, yeah, well, you can digitally scan me one time um, and use it for that, but then they use it for the, for a sequel or something. You know, I guess if they see that, but in a lot of cases, your actors are not always going to see that. So um, that's a great question. Certainly that's somewhere where technology would be of use, certainly to be able to catch that and maybe come up with an automated way of flagging that, watermarking that, however you want to describe that. But yeah. 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 There's a number, there's a number of tools. I mean, and generative AI, in, in many cases, is just inputs and outputs, a just different medium. And that's really what blockchain, I mean, the Bitcoin is inputs and outputs. So that's really what it comes down to. And the proof that an input and an output happened and, uh, and the history of that being documented. So the same thing has to apply in, in any industry that is going to want to be protected against that sort of... Uh, a replication. I mean, digital money uh, was never successful over the years until Bitcoin was created in 2009. It was tried, but the mere fact that you can replicate a picture of gold a billion times and they all look the same, you know, suggests that uh, there are certain other components needed in order to take something from a from a a real life format into a digital format and 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 prove its authenticity. So that's a very interesting thing, and it's and it it, it does surprise me that uh, that that detection uh, that some kind of detection model wasn't uh, elaborated on during these contractual uh, agreements, and then and then we're we're faced with the same thing with actors during the the current SAG strike. That right. uh, that it, it, uh, it, go ahead, yeah. No, I was going to say, and, and maybe some of these conversations have taken place. Perhaps um, people discussing the potential of using, you know, generative AI to be able to um, to work around some of this. But at least in terms of every, anything that I've read or from my understanding, uh, none of this has been at least publicly disclosed in any of these conversations. 
Right, right. So the uh, the the challenge is going to be uh, uh, not only enforcing the uh, the challenge is going to be for the people that are looking for the protection, knowing where they need that protection. Would you uh, like? Is it going to be always after the fact? I mean, after a movie's released, now an actor can use a detection tool to find out if a likeness has been has been used in a film and uh, and then go after the studios. What, what's the likelihood that an actor or an actor's agent or someone has the resources to go after a studio after a film is released? Is this something that is uh, uh, would be an impossible task or is it something that should be created uh, or stop before it can happen? Or what's your opinion on that? The best way to the best way to manage mm-hmm. uh, a a uh, an infraction, let's call it an infraction, to the, any of those agreements. Sure, I mean, I, I think the best way to do it is if you can if you can stop it before things are actually distributed. If if there's a way um, to use AI technology to be able to to pick this up in some way that it can be flagged, so that then an attorney or, and, and the actor themselves or or, or a writer in certain cases. Uh, would be aware of these things before the actual distribution takes place, because it seems like to me, with most anything, you know, try to nip it in a bud, try to take care of it before it, then it's only going to escalate further once the content gets out there. It's going to be, from a legal standpoint, more com- complex and probably more costly for the studio. Um, I would imagine trying to do that than than if it than if it extends out. So, um, I think that would be the 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 place where you try to pick that up. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me the the uh, are we slowly moving away from the uh, the the uh, the theater model? I mean, is it is it when a when a film is produced or when there are productions in in the in the entertainment industry specific to film and television or specific to film? Are we moving away from the model of opens in the theaters and it's there and then it goes into secondary, which is the which is streaming and things like that, or, or is everybody looking at streaming because that's where the volume of viewership is? What What are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, well, I think the traditional windowing model, I think, still still stands as the dominant way that yes, that you have these these uh, exclusive windows where you know again the theatrical run, and then later it goes to to um, pay TV or or something like that. A, 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 a premium channel on cable and then it goes to more general cable than to broadcast that model has been in place for a long time i think still dominates but you are seeing some you know examples of cases where certain films they're trying different things with distribution of course we saw during the the pandemic for instance hbo max was releasing films at simultaneously what was going on in the theater of course that was in the midst of 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 the covid19 lockdowns so that was a sp- kind of special case scenario, but we still see it. We're still seeing it some some recently um, with a few film friend or a few films that are being uh, where they're toying with that idea. Okay, let's do a simultaneous release on streaming versus the theater. And I think it depends on the type of IP, the type of content you're looking at, as to when you can most effectively do that. Um, but I still think, yeah, I still think at least for the time being, the kind of the traditional windowing model, you know, stands firm. So in the uh, in the grand scheme of film production, um, who is the who is the dominant force in your opinion in terms of uh, uh, I guess volume? Is it the Netflixes of the world? Is it Amazon? Is it are the, is it the big studios? Like who who is going to win this war of uh, coming? You know, subscribe to us and uh, and uh, that's all you need, or will it, or will that ever be the case? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, you know, so are you are you saying volume in terms of uh, a sales revenue or volume in terms of production? Content? Yeah, content. Okay. Content. Like content. every day. Yeah. Sure. Well, that's that's an interesting question. I, I do think that if you look at it, at least for right now, perhaps the streamers such as Netflix have an upper hand, or at least Netflix specifically does, of the streamers, um, because they have a capability and they pride themselves on producing a, a ton of content and a lot of their original content and some of their original content is done quite well critically as well as in terms of revenues. Um, and, but they, 
they themselves have a big advantage over the other streamers based on just the, the sheer fact that they're actually the only streaming platform that's so far been able to turn a profit. The other streaming platforms are not able to turn a profit and they're actually kind of cutting back some of them on the amount of productions that they're doing uh, in an effort to focus on specific productions and making those particularly uh, particularly profitable. Now, uh, you know, I know that uh, Disney, for instance, is hoping to turn the corner in another year. I know um, some of the other streamers are also hoping that they'll turn the corner and start becoming profitable. And Netflix is the only one so far. And a lot of that comes down, of course, being the first mover advantage, being the ones that were the first to the table and the ones that really upended the whole industry to begin with. You know, I think certainly your 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 um, your major studios and looking outside of uh, of streaming certainly they they still have a lot of you know influence obviously and of course they're tied into to overarching media conglomerates that also where they're tied to the streaming platforms you know um, and things like that um, such as the case with Hulu right I mean Hulu being being um, mostly run now by Disney. Um, so there are some of those relationships. So I think at the high level, I think there's still those major companies still have a great deal of great deal of power because they've got different ways of, of releasing content. But if you break it down more specifically and come down a few a few notches uh, off of those um, corporate ladders and you get into this to, to divisions of companies, I think, yeah, I think streamers in terms of the amount of content will have some of those advantages because if they can, there's just some efficiencies that they have built in in terms of production. Um, but like I said, other than Netflix though, these other streaming platforms are not able to come profitable right now. With, um, with SAG and with the efforts to bring more equality to the industry, um, is there going to be fewer big stars and uh, more little stars and uh, uh, I mean I, I I can't help to bring up the uh, the residuals that uh, in, in the news that uh, the 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 cast of friends were getting 20 million dollars a year just in residuals and so it, it just it shocked me to see that those numbers and some of the numbers with Seinfeld and things of that nature what are your thoughts on on how this uh, this recent revolt uh, of the of the little guy is going to shake up the uh, the bigger part of the industry? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and I, I think you're gonna you're you're gonna see different different philosophies put forth in terms of production. I think you're gonna see in a cost cutting measure, yeah, some of these some of these uh, production companies trying to work with you know lesser known actors and things like that, where they and of course the nice thing with the potential tools of AI and for predictive analytics and things is that we can have a better sense specifically of the types of content or the types of of stars that are really going to resonate well with potential audiences. So I think when you have more audience data like that, you it will make it easier than to maybe identify some of these up and coming performers or lesser known people that could certainly save you a lot of money. Because you're right, certainly yeah, looking back at some of those shows just a tremendous amount of money being being spent um, going out there for residuals because there's such an incredible uh, syndication market for a show like Friends or Seinfeld and all that, that aftermarket and everything is, is 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 something massive. So, but I still think, yes, you're going to have some producers though, certainly the larger companies, those that have a little deeper pockets that are still going to a lot uh, center their content around certain stars, realizing, hey, that, that a certain performer is going to bring in a particular audience, and that's an audience that they really desire. Uh, again, based on their analytics, and their analytics is showing that yeah, you cast this this certain group of of um, actors in a film that they're going to bring in this audience, and they're going to bring in you know certain amounts of revenue. So I think you're going to see different philosophies. But like I said, I think that the capabilities of, of generative AI in terms of being able to do audience forecasting and understanding audiences better and how to market to them better, I think those are only going to improve. So I think that'll, that will be something that, again, will lead to a lot of cases. Yeah, smaller smaller stars being identified, though, but those that would resonate really well with potential audiences. We're talking about uh, 
uh, big money. We're talking about uh, equality um, in um, in technology right now. We have the ability to we have the ability to create a smart contract that can automatically p- make a payment to somebody based on certain criteria, based on certain uh, elements of a of a of a of a, uh, a program. What are your thoughts on uh, on the crypto industry uh, um, working within the entertainment industry, including the music industry, and automatically making payments to people that uh, that are involved in a production? So, for example, the uh, if, a, if, a, if a song is played on the radio, it can easily be picked up and monitored. And if a person was supposed to be paid, or if the creator or a, a a co-creator or someone involved in that production uh, is uh, contractually going to receive a percentage based on a dollar, um, get paid that automatically using crypto in real time over the internet. What are your thoughts on something as efficient as, as that? Great question, Brett. Uh, you know, that is a, Game changer. That would be. I think that would be tremendously helpful. Uh, it would. It would certainly make things a lot more efficient. I was reading recently that there are. It's estimated about two point one billion dollars every year are being paid out in residuals, and about fifteen percent of that, though, is unclaimed or does not get to the appropriate uh, to the actors, to the writers, the people that are behind the creativity. And uh, so that equates to, you know, about $300 million uh, that just ends up kind of landing or staying in the, the coffers of the, of the studios and not being distributed to the talent behind it. So I think that, that yeah, I think that's a real game changer and something is, is very much needed so that we don't have things like that. We don't have some 15% of this slipping through the cracks and there's a way that you can, you can deal with this. Because I was also reading that, yeah, it's a real hassle for some of these people, whether they're either trying to correct, uh, collect residuals from a past show or maybe even from maybe their their uh, late father or whoever else, you know, someone may have passed away and their heirs are trying to collect that. If it's an older show, particularly, it can be problematic and can take a long time for that to be worked out. So I think, yeah, the capabilities of blockchain technology, the capabilities to have these smart contracts would be Tremendous, and I think there's a. To me, I feel like there's a real opportunity there to be able to automate that system and make sure that this happens in real time. People are getting paid more quickly. It's a much more efficient system than the way it is right now. Right now, it's very messy. There's, um, you know, uh, different Excel spreadsheets that are used, and things um, get held up when they go back to the unions. When the when the payments go to the unions and then goes to the again to the performers or the talent or their heirs. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of problems there. Do you think that those problems are sufficient that uh, would keep people from um, entering the industry? You, you know, you're very close to that. You're you're at a level where you're teaching about it. You're 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 constantly um, looking out for the latest trends and things of that nature. Is it mm-hmm. because of these challenges? And even what did I see yesterday uh, with uh, Spotify changing their payment model and extending the period or increasing the number of songs before somebody gets uh I mean it's really crazy how when it's so centralized like that hey eh, as you as you can see that uh it's just a one-sided deal for 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 the big guy all the time so are there people that are just aren't aren't interested in entering the, the industry because of, of that challenge and that they're going to end up slinging coffee and hot dogs until they get that big call for a, for a, for a movie part with, you know, Robert De Niro, like, like, tell me, give me your thoughts on that. Well, I think it certainly can be a detractor. Yes, I, I do. Uh, particularly when you consider just residuals alone that, you know, for a lot of actors, I think I read it's around about 40%, I believe of, of the way that they are compensated. We come through come from residuals and maybe 30 percent for writers. So I think it's a, a substantial amount. And I do think that the yeah, that that could hold some people back from entering the industry, realizing that, hey, look, am I going to 
be appropriately compensated for my work? Is my work just going to be out there for studios to make money on, but then I'm not going to be receive benefits, uh, the appropriate benefits I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to receive. Now, of course, um, you know, for a lot of people though, it's, it's enough of a, you know, it's their dream, it's their passion, and they're going to, to enter the industry regardless of the risks or regardless of the issues with residuals and other, other types of related things. Um, but I do think, yeah, I do think that it certainly did, will keep some people away from the industry and certainly be a detractor for those that are deciding, okay, I, I this is definitely what the industry I want to enter. I want to be a writer. I want to be an actor. I want to be a director. But just these things certainly hold them back in terms of their their um, level of satisfaction that they feel toward their work and potentially could lead to some of them saying, okay, I'm going to go and do something else or or getting involved in, yeah, uh, you know, another industry related or not. Yeah. We're talking about money here, um, income. Uh, tell me what, uh, let's go back to funding. Let's look at funding. Let's look at the, uh, the what drives funding in the United States. As you know, I'm in Canada and, and uh, um, without uh, uh, investment tax credits up here, without uh, the, the, the tax credits that are afforded to investors in film and television and the very strict rules that they have. Uh, there is no, there is no film industry, and that's the way I see it in Canada. What are your thoughts on that, and, and um, uh, how important is it that uh, the accounting side of the film production, music production, whatever, uh, is as important as the quality of the content? Uh, um, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Um, you're saying accounting in terms of. You mean it's just, sorry, but in, to invest, you know, to raise funds to put together a production, uh, aside from a studio having the ability to open up their bank account in their own wallet and fund these things for several hundreds of millions of dollars, but for a for an indie producer to go out there into the public market and find funding, uh, the 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 necessity to have accurate banking or accurate transaction records, the the, the, the necessity to, to be able to properly account for every dollar that's put in there so that an investor has the ability to use that uh, as a as a tax advantage to him. This is these are the sorts of things I'm talking about. So the work that's involved in accounting uh, for investments is uh, is as important as the content of that film or production itself. Because without that money, you're not going to build the production. Your thoughts on that? Right. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, for their independent producers, it can be, you know, it can be a real, real challenge, right? Because you're trying to, you know, put the money behind everything for, you know, from producing the, the content to be able to market it, to be able to work out distribution deals. And um, yeah, and it's very important to be able to, to have tools in place that'll, that'll keep track of, of your transactions with, with different parties and making sure that you're, all that is in line, and and obviously, yeah. In terms of investors, uh, investors are are going to want to look at that, and of course, that's a that's a very important part for an independent producer to be able to find these individuals and to be able to find these sources that are going to help invest in in their content, invest in what they're doing. Um, yeah, so I think it's a real challenge. Now, certainly, yes, you you kind of alluded to before things like tax credits and things, and of course, that's that's a, a key benefit, certainly for producing in certain areas, right? I mean, we know that there's yeah, a lot of production, for instance, taking place in the state of Georgia right now, because it's it's less expensive than a lot of places. There's some nice tax credits there. There's nice tax credits, in, at least in Vancouver, Canada, I know there's, there's a fair amount going on up there. Um, I'm not sure about, yeah, the rest of Canada, if there's, if there's really uh, places like that. But certainly, yeah, that, that bodes well for the um, you know the independent producer certainly has to strongly consider any type of discounts or any type of advantages financially that they can in terms of production or or, or efficiencies. Um, and yeah, this comes down to looking at the tax credits to be able to have the appropriate people um, that and the appropriate technology that you're using to be able to keep up with again all of your expenses and trying to do things efficiently as you can. 
because you're right. If you're trying to find investors, they they want to know very very much about where you stand financially, and they want to be able to truly see you know what your business model is, and they want to understand what the what the uh, revenue shares are going to be percent revenue shares will be with distributors, for instance, and things like that. They want to definitely see that. Yeah, the uh, the, um, um, the the foundation for that question really was was the fact that crypto allows the the uh, uh, immutable uh, recording of all of these transactions on the on the blockchain, and this is where we're going to end up. This is where we're trying to end up today. That's AI blockchain. So if you were to build a complete production on the blockchain, everything from chain of title to all your contracts and things of that nature, which are really crucial to the success of a, of a distribution deal. If you don't have all your chain, if you don't have your chain of title in place with all of your, your uh, 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 IP and everything like that, and then something happens after distribution, you're because you didn't get a, you know, a, a write off on something, or you didn't get someone approval on using something for a, a film, you're in big trouble. So the, the blockchain allows a lot of, it brings a lot of efficiencies and it brings them automatically. So that's where I was going with that. And then of course the, you know, the crypto being paid in crypto is a, and I hate even to use that word because it's not a nice word. People don't like it, especially in light of the, the recent FTX uh, scandal that is all over the news every day, front and center. But uh, the reality is that, uh, uh, we have the ability in in this technology that we are in love with and that we are trying to uh, um, to build for the media and entertainment industry. We have the ability to improve a lot, and that's improve a lot from payments, improve a lot from contracts, improve a lot from agreements, improve, improve a lot from the AI side of things. Again, we're we're. We are going to be uh, uh, putting together a roundtable on blockchain and AI, and I want to take this opportunity to uh, to invite you to join this roundtable, and that's with some people in the U.S. that are that are uh, uh, are, are are passionate about AI and experienced in AI, and uh, I think it's going to be something that uh, that I know you will, you will be interested in. But we do feel very strongly and very passionately about the fact that the technology can solve a lot of the problems, some of the problems that I don't think uh, the industry even knows it has yet. Because clearly, if there's the detection tools aren't part of the agreement with the Writers Guild, and if the detection tools aren't part of the agreement with SAG and uh, AM, uh, and the and the studios, then it's all for naught. It's like, okay, well, we're protected, but you know, how do you know if there's a violation, right? If you, if, if you don't know, and this is probably something that the studios are counting on, right? They, they didn't ask about how they're going to figure it out, you know, like, all right. Yeah. So, so, so that's, um, um, I mean, that's, that's my perspective. And I, and I, uh, um, in your, in your travels in your in the in the education system and through the the last few years have you gotten some feedback from students and other faculty and things like that on this whole crypto blockchain uh and and if any of it is bleeding into the film or into your uh media and entertainment side of things are you getting any feedback or are there some uninformed and ill-informed people that are that are within the within the educational system that that needs to be that need to be informed better. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, Brett, absolutely. I, I think I think one of the problems is yeah. I think a lot of people are they don't really um, understand it or they haven't really taken the time to really kind of research it, understand what it's all about. I think sometimes there some people have a negative connotation or they're that you know crypto currency and things like that has a negative connotation for some people. Um, so I think largely the, the capabilities here and all the positives here um, so far are not really being discussed. I, I go to these academic and some industry conferences and, I, and I've seen very little um, right now about the capabilities of the blockchain and, the, and some of the things you talked about. I mean, the fact that it's, that, you know, it will contain all this information and that it's secure and that it's immutable. You can't change 
what's in the blockchain. So the, it, it really hasn't been discussed a lot. I will say that um, in several of my classes, I have students do news reports where they talk about a current news uh, uh, news development and we talk about it as a class. I have had a few students that did choose to talk about blockchain and AI, but still as a percentage of, of all the presentations I've had, it's still been a, it's still been a very small small percent, but some have chosen that and have done a nice job. But I think that um, in terms of my school, in terms of other schools that teach film and entertainment, television, um, they're not doing a very good job of really exploring blockchain and really exploring the the uh, advantages that it can bring to the table. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I won't say that I'm, I'm disappointed to hear that because I I, I now am uh, uh, fairly well connected to somebody that can maybe start fixing that. And, uh, and, and that's maybe something we should talk about next time and, uh, or, you know, in an ongoing way, and part, maybe part of our roundtable on the blockchain and AI, AI that sure. we, could, uh, we could include maybe your class or something like that in our efforts to, uh, to bring awareness. We're, our goal is to build some tools and our goal is to build some detection tools that the industry can use on both sides and uh, use those in a uh, using a, uh, um, a permissioned blockchain like uh, like, what is, uh, like uh, Hyperledger Fabric, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to some of the a lot of people think blockchains are all public. Like the Bitcoin blockchain is public. Anybody can go on there. You don't know who's there. Uh, the Ethereum blockchain is also a public blockchain, but there are some permissioned components to it. So I think I'd like to uh, leave the door open if you would agree to that. And, and, and let's talk down the road about, uh, about introducing some of this to your, your student body and, and your faculty and keep you in the loop and have you a part of our, our, our growing uh, uh, development of uh, of products that are going to only enhance the industry. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. No, Brett, that, that sounds great. I certainly welcome the opportunity. I'm looking forward to being part of the, the roundtable discussion you mentioned, and certainly whatever I can do on my end to um, to help. And 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 certainly I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to <clears throat> to work with you to make inroads through not only educate higher education but also the industry in terms of making some of these you know, getting these companies and, and the educational system to understand these capabilities and how helpful it can be to the industry. Sure. That's, that's, that's pretty awesome to hear. I have one, one last question for you, and we don't have a lot of participants here, and we'll see if Randy has any questions in a minute, but one of the things I want to ask you personally is uh, um, how did you get into the industry? What, what was your, uh, what was the spark that uh, got you going in the direction you're going to become an associate professor at a at a California university. Would you mind answering that question? Sure, sure. I, I, are you saying more for higher education or more the entertainment industry? Well, or? just yeah, the the entertainment side of and and the and the education, the blend of those two things that uh, I think sure. are pretty awesome. Go ahead. No, thanks, thanks. Yeah, it's been kind of a unique a unique journey. Um, you know, I graduated with an undergraduate degree in marketing, and but at the time when I got into marketing, I I felt like I would enjoy a, a sales career, but I didn't know what industry. And, it, and and I began to, I worked in a couple of different in telecommunications, did some other things, but I guess I was about 25 and I and I came across um, actually friends of my mom and stepdad, this this guy that um, was um, was a vice president of this broadcast company, Pegasus Broadcasting. And anyway, um, we met one time for, for a drink and just talked about, and I had a sales background and he talk to me about the broadcast industry. And then later I met with his wife who, who uh, ran an ad agency. And I just, and we talked about Nielsen about numbers and all that. And I just realized that there was something I was really passionate about and excited about. And um, so then I, I went into that and then, and then went into working in broadcast television first for Warner brothers and UPN networks before they merged become CW. And I worked for, for uh, CBS as well. I did some uh, radio sales, but during the time that I was working in network, uh, working in broadcast TV, I started working on a graduate degree. And at the thought was at the time, either in 10 years, I want to either be a professor or I wanted to be a, um, a general uh, TV station general manager. And 
anyway, during the, the time as a graduate student, I had a chance to guest lecture for one of my my uh, business or uh, media law professors and really loved the experience. And after doing it about the second or third time, I said, you know what, I think I think this is what I want to do moving forward. And then uh, then I started preparing myself to potentially enter a PhD program in this area. And, and, and I did that. I was did my graduate work at my master's at University of Florida and I decided to stay there for my PhD there at University of Florida. And I got into to higher education. I will say sort of in the back of my mind, um, my my parents are, are in higher education. So I kind of had that a little bit in the back of my mind, even from growing up, but it was, but it wasn't something I was ready to jump into right away. Um, I really was wanted to make sure I found the right industry for me. And, uh, and yeah, so then I, then I got into higher ed full time in 2014 and, and uh, took a job in New York, uh, SUNY New Paltz. We, so I went from one big state system in New York to a big one here in California. And I've been at Cal State and Northridge since fall of 2017. So six years now, and it, it's been great. You know, it's, it's, I enjoy, you know, working in higher ed. I enjoy, you know, teaching and working with students. I really enjoy the research and going to conferences and talking to other other people that are studying similar things or some different different areas. So it's been uh, it's been good. But that's kind of how it's all come together. And I, I I'm very much it's very important to me to to maintain good relationships with the industry. I I do a little bit of consulting work on the side. It's something I want to do more of and definitely want to continue those industry relationships and and um, potentially you know launch more of a more of a consulting business or or something um something you know moving forward so that's a little bit kind of a little bit about my story but it's sort of a like i said um first finding the entertainment industry but always in the back of my mind the higher education route and then having that opportunity to finally teach a few a few le do a few lectures and really find it i really loved it so yeah that's a great story that is a phenomenal story i love that uh, you're 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 doing what you love doing, and uh, you wake up every day and you go to bed with a smile on your face, and that's uh, uh, that's a great world to be in, you know. And and uh, good for you, and that's uh, that's a lot of hard work on your part to get there. I have one last question for you. What, if anything, would you change about the education system at uh, the level you're at? Is that a is that a too broad a question? I just and I and I was going to say specific to the entertainment uh, field that you're in, but education is a big thing, and I'm a big follower of U.S. news and things of that nature. But I, just out of interest, the uh, if you had if you had one wish and you could you could change the education system, what would you do? If you don't mind that question, sure, no problem. Well, I I think it would be, I think, you know, more greater inroads with industry. I think sometimes they're, I think we do a generally good job in my department at Cal State Northridge, but I have seen in other departments and other, um, not only in our industry, but in others, but where there's sometimes there's a little bit more of a, of a silo there where it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that way, that it shouldn't be that, you know, we're in this ivory tower and we're separate from industry and the rest of the world. And like I said, I don't think our, department is but i've seen it with some with other departments sometimes and i think sometimes there's um a not enough uh, you know some professors are really good about about in the latest industry developments and bringing that in the classroom and bringing in guest speakers and things like that I, I try to do those things but there are some professors that are are teaching some older material some of it's kind of outdated um and some of them they're not keeping up enough with what's going out on out in the industry and I think certainly that puts students at a, a disadvantage when that's not being done appropriately. I mean, again, the most important thing, I mean, technologies are always going to change and the way things are being done. And our, our main goal certainly is to, to teach students to think, to be able to think and be able to process information and to be able to create and develop from that. Um, that's our primary goal. But, but I think uh, we need to, as best we can, though, uh, keep them up to date on what's occurring in the field where it's moving in the next five, 10 years. So they're best prepared when they, when they graduate. Good stuff. Randy, you have some, anything for, uh, for Todd today? I, yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, how did you get into blockchain and um, the web three and AI technology? 
Well, it, it's something I, you know, I've been, I've been passionate about for a while, uh, it, but it's something I, I'm still kind of learning about. Um, and, um, but yeah, I'm, I've recently uh, started doing some interviews with people in the industry about AI and asking a few questions about blockchain. And um, I actually just started doing this recently and uh, I'm talking to particularly people that are impacted by the strikes. And I, I, ideally I'd like to put together some sort of documentary of some sort or, or something uh, to compile these uh, these interviews and put them on certainly on the near term on a YouTube channel, everything which I haven't yet yet launched. But uh, but so it's always been interesting of mine. And um, it really kind of started was I was they were looking for volunteers or panelists for a panel about four or five years ago on AI. And I, I volunteered. I'd done a little bit of background research on it. So I volunteered to do that. But in preparation for that, I I explored it a lot more in depth and uh, just found it very, very fascinating, um, particularly like the predictive analytics and the generative AI and all the capabilities in terms of what it can do for production, what it can do for marketing, what it can do for, um, you know, all of those things. And of course, of course, tying in with what we're talking about today in terms of making sure that that there's more efficient ways that people can be compensated with the residuals and such. Um, but yeah, it's certainly I want to, uh, something, Randy, I, I want to learn a lot more about and and I uh, want to continue doing that and and doing and, and talking today on this point. And then in my conversation with Brett, certainly I'm I'm learning, learning as we're going along here, too. So excellent. As yes, I am. And, yes. And same here as we are. Yeah. Sure. Yes. As we are together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and, um, and this the, this will be my last question. Um, and um, how do you think that this technology can be used to make the streaming prof uh, platforms more profitable and maybe creating a segue where independent artists can kind of get in, kind of like more equitable um, access for like mm -hmm. those that don't have the resources? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see that? How do you see blockchain and AI play into that aspect? of the industry? Sure. No, a great, great question. I, I, I mean, I think in terms of the, um, in terms of the streamers, I, I in terms of being more profitable, <clears throat> I think it does really help the, the fact that they can streamline some of these processes that they, that in terms of production that you can, you can use AI in certain ways to help to do certain types of shots and to, to do things like using like drones, like, you know, and, and, and doing like, maybe more risky or almost sometimes even physically risky camera shots and things like that, where you can use AI technology to do those. So I think that that instead of having to pay someone a, a, a lot of money to do that, you can use those tools to do that. And I think the fact that, yeah, you can use the tools even in terms of coming up with additional uh, initial ideas for programs and for content, I think using that to, you know, at least as a, maybe a starting point or something that you can integrate in with the creativity of, a, of an individual. I mean, I think obviously, I mean, we, there's always a concern about AI displacing jobs. And I look at it within a, a creative field like entertainment, we're always gonna need people. You're always gonna need, because the one thing AI is not gonna be as good at is in terms of you know, the creativity, in terms of being able to synthesize and put some information together. I mean, that's something that the human brain will do, but but certainly, yeah, using it in combination with with the the human touch, at least in terms of content creation, is really really important thing. I think, though, in terms of um, the efficiency, certainly with a lot of things we're talking about today, I think AI is extremely beneficial there in terms of you know efficiencies and residuals and making sure if you can automate that process, everyone will be happier that way, and certainly that'll reduce costs to the streamer streaming platforms reduce the cost to the unions in trying to um to disperse these payments and having to pay certain people uh, money to be able to kind of reconcile that if you can automate that you know certainly i think that that would be a, certainly a cost saver there i think in terms of giving people the opportunity um some of your independent people coming in or people again that are new to the industry and they're trying to make inroads they're starting their own production companies, things like that. I think, yeah, all these tools are 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 going to provide efficiencies. They're going to help them um, in terms of yeah, in terms of reducing costs 
and and saving time in terms of not only um, you know creating content, also marketing distribution to be able to. I think in terms of uh, analyzing particular audience segments, I think AI technology is really beneficial for that to be able to use that to be able to hone in. Like okay, so you have this content. This is an audience. This is an you know using machine learning. This is an audience that this might really resonate with, and I think that'll help certainly your your up and coming um, producers and people trying to make inroads to um, to appropriately market what they're doing and, and have the right content to the right audience. And then I think yeah, automating the the payment process and all that certainly is going to reduce then maybe the amount of people you have to to um, pay for those positions, but a lot of it, the efficiency. So I do think, yeah, I do think it helps a along the way and um, a lot. I do think, again, it needs to happen in conjunction with, with people as well. And it might mean certainly in certain positions, as I've kind of alluded to, it would mean some job job displacement. But in a lot of cases, it, it, particularly because it's a creative industry, it wouldn't because, again, you still need people to, people to work with the technology. And just understanding where AI tools where they can really benefit you and then how you can use that in conjunction with with the human mind and people's creativity. Thank you. Pretty awesome. Welcome. Well, yeah. listen, Todd, this has been a pretty awesome uh, event today and uh, we appreciate your insights. Uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, we have a lot more to talk about. So let's, uh, let's continue the discussion. Yes. The, uh, the, um, Today we had a, a pretty awesome discussion with Todd Holmes, the Associate Professor of Entertainment Media Management at California State University, Northridge. And I wanna thank you, Todd, for taking the time today. And we're gonna see you again soon, I hope. Enjoy yes. the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Brett. Thank you, Randy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so Enjoy. much, Todd and Brett. Take care, Randy. Take care, you Todd. Too. Talk to you soon. Take, Take care. Talk Take to you care, soon. Take care, both of you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.